Hey everybody, before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 102. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, a psychologist from Southern California and the author of the Hardcore Self-Help book series. And before I say anything else, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you. Um, You know, I I periodically just need to say thanks because this is a weird thing. You know, I sit in my office and I record questions and interviews and I broadcast them out to the world and, you know, tens of thousands of you guys listen to them and, and try to get something out of it. So it's just a crazy scenario and it's a beautiful part of being alive in this day and age. And I just really appreciate your attention. I appreciate your support. I appreciate your questions, your feedback, all of that. So just thank you. Um, This week is going to be an interview. I'm interviewing Dr. Ron Holt, at Dr. Ron Holt on Twitter. He's an amazing guy. Um, As he puts it, he's a proud gay man, and he's also a psychiatrist who does not focus necessarily on clinical practice anymore, but focuses more on advocacy for LGBTQ issues. And so we talk a lot about that. We talk about um, the process of coming out, how to do that safely, all sorts of really, really interesting stuff. And I'm just super happy to have him on the show because he can talk about a lot of stuff that, you know, I have no lived experience of. So it was a really good interview, and I I do hope that you enjoy it. Next week, I will be back with another question and answer episode. I'm not going to have alternating episodes every single week. Uh, It really depends on how many interviews I can get scheduled and stuff like that. But I do have one more interview in the can, so you can expect that in a couple weeks here. Um, But yeah, next week will be another question and answer. So if you do have questions for me about life, about relationships, about school, about mental health, uh, psychiatric disorders, anything like that, shoot them over to me at duffthepsych at gmail.com and I'd be happy to consider them for the next episode of the podcast. But for now, let's go ahead and get into the interview with Dr. Ron Holt. All right, everybody. So uh, today I have a guest on the podcast, uh, Dr. Ron Holt. He is a psychiatrist and he focuses on LGBTQ issues and he's got some really interesting things going on that I'd love to talk with him about. So uh, Ron, welcome to the show. Hi, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. To start off with, can you tell me a little bit of context just about you? You know, um, I understand you're not practicing anymore. You took an early retirement. You told me a little bit about that. Um, But sort of like, what's your background? Where are you from? Give me some context. Sure. So uh, my name is Ron Holt. Uh, I was born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska, and uh, did my medical school training uh, in in the Midwest as well, and then did some training uh, down in Houston, Texas, and then ended up out here in beautiful San Francisco. And uh, I've been in San Francisco, oh gosh, for about 22 years now. And for 20 of those years, I actually practiced clinical psychiatry at a large medical group here in Northern California. Uh, But it was last year um, after my mom had passed away and after seeing what happened during the election that I realized that I needed to devote more of my time to doing what really made me happy. And that was um, focusing more uh, on advocacy for the lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans community. Mm. So when I yeah, so when I uh, retired in March of last year, I started working more full time uh, doing uh, advocacy presentations, writing books and coloring books and doing more presentations across the country. Now, was the focus on, um, you know, LGBTQ issues something that you had focused on during your your practice as a psychiatrist? You know what? That's a great question. Is it a matter of fact, it is. Um, so, you know, my first two years of being a psychiatrist, you know, I thought, wow, this is really great. I've made it. I've gone through all my schooling. I now have a job. I'm doing what it is that I've been trained to do for, you know, gosh, 12 years. And about my third year into it, I started realizing that there was something missing in my life. I felt like maybe, um, 
I still had kind of an itching in my soul to kind of give back to the community, like the GLBT community. Mm -hmm. And so about 18 years ago is when I started using my vacation time uh, to go back to the Midwest where I'm from and um, talk about LGBTQ issues. And I really focused those talks mostly in the rural areas because those are the places that really needed it the most and had the least resources. Yeah. And so that's that's when I really started doing this. It was about 18 years ago. Wow. Um, and just to rewind for the listeners, so um, a psychiatrist, uh, like what did you do in your job as, as uh, you know, when you're practicing clinically? What did that consist of? So I was actually working full time and I was working in an outpatient uh, psych- psychiatric clinic. And so that just included just evaluations, uh, the, the dispensing of medications after, di- you know, diagnosing someone, putting them in, in the hospital if, if, if we needed to, and then just following up after they were discharged from, from the hospital. Mm. So it was much more um, clinical work uh, during those those tw- 20 years. Not a lot of it didn't really allow me to do a lot of advocacy within the organization. And so I was, I was able to do it outside of it during my vacation time. Were you kind of, uh, I, I, you know, I've worked in some medical settings before I, I worked yeah. for, um, Kaiser for a while in, in oh, California. Okay. And, you know, my experience with it is you're kind of just jammed, like, you know, seeing patient after patient after patient and then doing thing after thing. And there's not a lot of time to breathe in between those. Was that your experience of it too? That was totally my experience of it. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is a totally different ball game, what you're doing now. It is. It, it, it totally is. And, you know, it wasn't until after the election occurred and we started seeing like a rollback and, and a reversal of, of GLBT rights uh, from their, our very own administration that made me realize, gosh, you know, I, I could sit there and continue to do this 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 grunt work every, every day of seeing patients back to back to back. Or I could, you know, give that part up in, in, in my life and start focusing more on these people who are really struggling now because of the way that society is now treating them. You know, there's, you kind of bring up an interesting topic of when you're a clinician of, of any type, be that psychiatrist or a psychologist like myself, uh, it can almost feel like there's an expectation to be only one thing, you know, to be that, that clinician and yes. to not have an opinion about things, not have uh, passions about other things. You know, you, you've already talked candidly about, you know, your views of the administration and what's happened since the election and stuff like that. Um, was that a, a, a kind of point of tension it, when you were practicing clinically? Um, I don't know that it was a point of tension for me at the time as it was that I really started, my eyes started to be open when I was watching the news and seeing these rollbacks like on trans people being able to, you know, serve in, in the military and GLPT rights being taken away in the school systems mm. and well, not, not being protected the way that they were. And I thought, you know, this is not right. I mean, I've have, I have these knowledge, skills and, and abilities that I've been you know, kind of crafting over the past eight, 18 years uh, outside of work. And so I need to kind of step up my game and, and start helping people who really don't have the resources or, or the ability to help themselves right now. Now, you have a obviously a passion for, for this, um, you know, type of individual and this type of work. How, how do you personally identify? I don't know a whole lot about you personally. Okay, sure. So yeah, I'm an op- openly proud gay man. Uh, but you know, coming out for me was not uh, the ideal experience uh, growing up. Uh, I was born and raised in, in Nebraska. And that's a very pretty conservative area. Sure. I will almost just say in the Bible, you know, Bible Belt area. And I had a father <clears throat> who was very homophobic. Mm. So he made it very difficult for me to come to the re- realization about my se- sexuality, to kind of experience the growth of what, what it's like to be a gay man, to kind of be out and proud about it. And so I really did not have the ability to be a really kind of a, a experience what it's like growing up as, as a gay, gay person until I was in my early uh, 20s, really. Oh, wow. OK. Yeah. And when you say your your father was was homophobic, do you mean, you know, you would see him, would he use like slurs toward people and things like that? He would. Yes. Yeah. And so he would make uh, comments about gay people or gay bashing. Uh-huh. And he would actually, you know, and, and even though I wasn't necessarily out to him, that didn't prevent him. I think my father knew that I was gay. And so he would make gay bashing comments towards me. Oh. And so even though I wasn't out to him, I mean, he would still, you know, call me a fag on, on occasion mm. or you're not going to make it in life or gay, gay people don't make it. And if I ever found out my son was gay, he'd be thrown out of the house. Okay. And so, <laughs> yeah. So I experienced that throughout, you know, um, really when I first started feeling those, those feelings in junior high and high school. So it was several years of, you know, literally emotional torture from him. Now, you know, uh, for you, was it a, a process of, did you feel like you had to stuff those down and try to get rid of those feelings? Or was it more that you just really didn't want them to be revealed and found out? 
Well, you know, that's a great question. I think for a lot of people, they, they kind of come out to themselves in various ways. And for me, I really struggle with, gosh, what are these feelings like? And is this normal to have, have these feelings because other guys aren't necessarily talking about this? And, and so I think for many years, I, I really did um, kind of struggle with my sexual orientation and did not al- allow myself to be authentic to who I was, you know, at least within my own self. And so I didn't really want to focus on that. And so I try to focus on a lot of other stuff. But so as, as you can imagine, I mean, if you're trying to do well in school and I, I, I ran track back then, mm-hmm. if, if you're trying to do all these other extracurricular activities, but you're not being honest about who you are, you can imagine the internalized damage that, that you're doing to yourself on a mental health level. Was there an element of that for you then um, that kind of – trying to keep that under the surface led to some other difficulties that you were having sure. as, a, as like an adolescent? Sure. A- a- absolutely. I mean, when I didn't feel good about myself and really couldn't be open and honest about who I was, it led to all, all sorts of mental health issues, including depression, uh, anxiety, uh, and occasional panic attacks. And there was even times where I felt like I'd be better off n- not alive. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I was going to ask about that. I know that there's a you know, the um, people who identify as, you know, gay, transgender, what what have you, they're overrepresented in the population of people who do think of or attempt suicide. There's 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 no question about that. In fact, most studies have shown that, you know, lesbian, gay and bisexual youth are up to four times more likely to attempt suicide compared to yeah. their straight peers. And for trans youth, it's even higher. It's nine times more, more likely compared right. to the cis population. And that's astronomically large. It is. You know, and, and if you can, I'd like you to address a point because I get, um, you know, this is a point that internet trolls will use a lot to say, well, you know, since the suicide rate's so high, that means that it's obviously a mental disorder. Like someone is, who's trans is messed up. It's a mental disorder. That's why they want to kill themselves. So, you know, they need help. They don't need to be accepted. Right. And, and that's, and I, it's actually just the opposite of that. I mean, these people need acceptance so that they don't have those thoughts of, of suicide. I mean, it's uh, being gay, lesbian, but bisexual, trans, that's something that no one chooses. Why, why would someone choose to have that, that kind of lifestyle where someone is going to victimize you or bully you or, or try to do harm towards you? I mean, people don't choose that. What, what they do choose is, is to live the life that feels most natural to them, but no one ever chooses to have that kind of life. And so what happens is that when – so imagine, and that's part of the reason why I didn't come out when, when I was younger because I saw all the other kids who, who were teased that were op- openly gay, and they had a horrible life. And because of being teased and because of being bullied and being harassed, they're at higher risk because of those um, those things that, that are happening to them. So it's not that it, it's a mental health dis- disorder. You know, honestly, hom- homophobia is the, ho- is the mental mm. health disorder. Sure. It's, not, it's not being gay. And so I think for a lot of people when they're struggling, it's, it's, it's hard enough growing up as an a- adolescent in, in today's society, let, let alone having to come out to ev- everybody about who you are. Right. And so, yeah. And so I, I, I really think that people have these thoughts of suicide at times and mental health issues because of the way that, that society treats them for being open and out about who they are. Right. I mean, it, it makes it kind of just makes sense, right? When you're it being totally told does. in so many different ways that you yeah. shouldn't exist, you kind right. of might think, well, maybe I shouldn't exist. Right. Yep. I yeah. agree. Yep. Now, I, I, you have a – I think you mentioned a video series about like coming out and, and safety around that. I do. Can you I tell do. me a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, last December, I decided to uh, do a coming out safely video series um, just to kind of help youth who are struggling uh, with their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And it's uh, actually available for free on on my website if if people wanted to go and and check it out. Which is where? Uh, Yeah, so so, so the website is drronholt.com. So it's D-R-R-O-N-H-O-L-T.com. And so, yeah, and so the the video series is on there. And so, basically, it's a it's a series of six videos. But it's a, I I kind of t- talk about the four stages of a person coming out. And, and you know, the, the the first thing I'd like to say is that really there is um, there's a right place and a right time for a person to come out, and it varies for each person. And so, it's a really personal de- decision that only can be made by the listener. Um, and a person should only come out when they feel personally ready to do so. I mean, I know there are some people that kind of pressure people saying, you know what, you're gay. Why don't you just come out? They, they may not be ready to do that. 
And so I think pressuring someone to come out and be open about who, who they are when they're not ready can cause them great emotional distress. Sure. And so it's really important for a person to come out when they feel ready to. And so there's kind of some four, four stages that I, I, like, I like to think about it mm-hmm. when, when, when a person's coming out. Do you mind if I go over those? Yeah, please. Okay. And so stage one is just when I think when period, uh, people have periods of feeling uncertainty about their sexual orientation or their gender I- identity. And that can occur at any age, really. You know, And this, this may be surprising to you, but so, for so, some trans kids, they actually know that they're trans starting around age two or three. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and a lot of people are like, oh no, it's not possible. It's like it is possible because kids who feel like they they've been born in the wrong gender, uh, they definitely know. And I've I've been at enough conferences and I've seen trans people up on on panels that have said, you know, I knew from a very young age that I did not want to sit down to pee because I was born as as a as a boy, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And so yeah, and so you know, it's you know, people say, oh no, they're not, they're too too young to know. They are they they're they're not too young to know. Well, people but sexualize it, it, you know. They they they, they, they yeah. say it's about sex, and they think you know that doesn't equal kids. And so it, right. it's it feels, uh, I guess, probably just feels icky to them for some reason because of the way sure. that they're interpreting it. But yeah, yeah it's a, it's a fundamental difference, is what it seems like. Absolutely, and really, gender has nothing to do with sex, right? I mean, our sexual orient- orientation is completely different than uh, gender. Do you mind if we sidebar for a second, and you, you, could you speak a little bit more to that, just for you know anybody listening that may not really get the difference? Sure, sure. So, so you know, so just in general, sex is is the anatomy that that we're born with at birth, right? And so, gender identity is is the is a social construct of what it means to be male or female in society. And so, for most people, um, their sex is congruent with the gender that's that's assigned to them at birth, right? But but for some people, it's not. And so, for some some people who are born in their and say that they have a a, a penis when they're born and they're mm-hmm. automatically assigned as male, they may grow up in two or three and say, you know what, I'm actually a female. And so uh, sex and gender can actually be two different things for uh, for people. Um, for most of us, it is it is congruent. But for some, it's not. Right. Yeah. And so uh, so did that a- a- answer your question? Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. I think I think people will sometimes confuse the two or, or use them interchangeably, right. especially with the language around things like a, a gender reveal party for a child and things like that. And, right. you know, gender is more about. Well, there's, you know, gender expression as well, like what you choose to, uh, you know, show outwardly about, you know, how you feel. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for for sidebarring there. So so let's get back to, so there's the the questioning part of, you know, some some questions about your identity and then what follows from that. Yeah. And so, and so for, for kids who are, who are, gen, you know, for trans can be anywhere from two or three on up. And then for kids with their sexual orientation, that generally starts to occur during our, our, our puberty. And that's usually anywhere from the age of 10 to 13. So it's not uncommon now, although someone can come out at any age, it's not uncommon now for kids to come out nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 years old. And again, it's not too early for them to know that they know it's just earlier than what we were used to in, in society for, for people coming out. Mm-hmm. And and so you know for so for, for for the stage one there's kids who are struggling with that and they're kind of un, uncertain about what what that means to them and that's okay that's it it's it's okay for them to be there as long as they actually need to and so each each person must take their own time to discover who it is that they are uh, the important thing is not to let others define who who they are and it needs to come from them and so once they've kind of worked through the stage one and say, you know what, I, I really feel like I, I do have attractions towards the same, you know, same sex or opposite sex or both both sexes, then so, sometimes people will actually go on to what I call stage two, which is a- acknowledging who, who they are. Mm-hmm. And at this stage, two main things actually occur. And I think the first thing is that there's actually a sense of, uh, of, of relief to acknowledge to, to, to themselves who they are. It's like, wow, OK, I, 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 I get this now. I'm not like my other classmates. You mm-hmm. know, I have. I have same 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 sex of attractions, but then in, in addition to that, when they kind of kind of uh, accept themselves and feel good about that, the next thing that happens, like, oh my God, now what? You know, how am I going to be accepted? Uh, how am right. I going to come out? Are my parents going to rea- how are my parents going to react? Am yeah. I going to be kicked out of the home? And so it's, that's kind of a frightening stage for actually people to be in. And so I don't really like it, you know, uh, when when people stay in that stage. And that's why I think it's important to reach out into the stage three, which for me is 
reaching out to people who you know will be accepting. And that may be like a teacher at school that maybe has a ra- rainbow flag up on, on, the, on, on their chair or in the, in the office or, mm-hmm. or maybe a, a counselor who's, who's come in and talked about GLBT issues in the, in the classroom or maybe a friend of yours who, who's, who's, who's already out. Uh, I think it's really important to uh, create a network of friends and support so that you don't feel like you're, you're alone. Because that's kind of a very frightening time. Yeah. Did you have one? I mean, you you were sort of, from what you described, kind of isolated. Yeah. So did you have something you know, like that? You know, that's a, that's a great question. And you know what? I, I really kind of didn't. And I actually came out, you know, over over 20 years ago. And so it was a lot different then than it is mm-hmm. now. And so, uh, you know, I didn't have the support that I, that kids certainly have now back then. They didn't have GSAs and like gay, gay straight alliances in schools. They didn't even have them in the, in the junior highs. They didn't have them even in colleges really. So things have changed a lot. And I think there are a lot more resources that are available, but no, back then I did not have much at all. And so you can, can imagine for someone my age and even people older that really struggled a lot when they were young because, hell, it wasn't until 1973 before the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, uh, said that being gay wasn't a mental illness. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it was, you know, it was actually considered a mental illness just 40 years ago. And so, you know, I know, which is amazing, right? Yeah. That's how long ago. And people hold on to that. You know, people still they hold do. on to that. They do. They, they, they really do. And there's been no, there's been no scientific studies that have shown that, sexual orientation or gender identity is somehow a mental health disorder. Yeah. People will say, you know, well, it causes you despair and it causes you, you know, trouble. And so therefore it's a disorder, but it's, that's more about the friction between who you are and the society that, that you're within. That's not something that's inherently negative. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so, and so again, you know, getting back to stage yeah. three, it's, it's really important to kind of build a support net, network around you of people that you know are going to be affirmative, right? And then from there, you can kind of go on to stage four, which to me is actually reaching out to people outside of the inner, inner circle. So for instance, like if a child is ready to come out to their parents who may not be, be supportive, or maybe your grandparents, or maybe a bully at school or, or friends or what, what whatever. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the that's that's for for me that that's kind of the final stage. And again, people can go in and out of, of these stages whenever they feel comfortable to do so. And there are some that may say, you know what, I'm I'm open and honest within myself, and I have some very close friends in which I am. But the rest of the people, I'm not going to come out to right now because I don't feel safe. Mm. And so, really, that's the really important thing. The message that I want to drive home is that people have to have a plan to feel safe in case things don't go the way that you want them to. And it sounds like kind of moving from stage three to stage four is one of the areas that that carries some of the most of that risk, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. Exactly. For some people, you know, depending on the situation, I mean, you know, I could see in your background with how you described your father, uh, you might be legitimately like afraid for your safety if you were to just come straight out with it, right? That's right. That's right. In fact, that's, that's the reason why I actually didn't come out until I graduated from college and was in my first year of medical school when I was actually physically in a different state away from him and was on financial aid so that he couldn't threaten to, to, to throw me out or take, take me out wow. of school. I was on my own. So that's, that's right. It's, it's important for people to recognize that there's, there's no like moral obligation to come out in, in any particular way. Cause I feel like nope. a situation like that, where you feel like you are um, forced to be closeted, it can carry a sort of guilt with it, I imagine. Well, sure. Guilt and, and, and not only that, but your own in, internalized sense of homophobia. So uh-huh. you take what, what do you take? What society says you are as a bad person and you internalize it. And that that's what can lead to the self-destructive behaviors like depression you know, pan, uh, panic attacks, uh, anxiety, drug, drug and alcohol misuse, having un- unsafe sex. Those are all symptoms of in- internalized hom- homophobia. Yeah. How do you suggest somebody recognize whether it, it's safe for them or not? You know, it, it may be something that's that's really hard for somebody to to actually recognize or understand just with themselves. Sure. Yeah. And so, you know, that's, you know, it's a, that's a good, good question. And I think what would be important first is to really develop a close safe, safety net of, of people around you that you know, love and trust and that you, that, that believe in you and, and are okay with who you are. 
And then once once you have that, then maybe say say that's maybe it's a counselor at, at your high school or maybe a counselor at, at, at your college. And then maybe you could start processing and talking through about stages of, OK, I feel like I want to come out to my parents now. Maybe let's kind of role, role play this. Let's kind of work, work through this. Mm-hmm. And so I think for some people, they really have to. I think for all, all of us, we have to find people who are safe for us to be around and be supportive of us. And then those people who can help us work through people who we, we may feel less safe around and actually have a plan in case things don't go up the, the way that we want to when we actually do do come out to that person. Yeah, you mentioned the plan. It, it kind of makes me think of, you know, what I might do in my practice with somebody who has maybe, you know, severe depression or something like that, where we would develop a safety plan regarding things like suicide, where, you know, what what three people can I call before hurting myself? What emergency numbers do I have? Things of that sort. That's great. um, Is there anything like that that you may suggest doing or that you've seen um, in this context? So I would say, you know, if, if people are struggling with their sexual orientation or their gender identity or even having thoughts of, you know, passive thoughts of, of, of harm, um, you know, the, there is a there's a good resource called the Trevor Project. Mm-hmm. It's the, the, the Trevor Project dot org. And they also have a toll, toll free 24 hour seven hotline uh, that a person can call and talk. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean because they're, they're in imminent needs or that they're going to harm themselves, but just maybe to talk through their sexual orientation or their gender identity, or maybe talk about coping skills or, or, or may, making a safety plan for themselves when, when they do come out. Mm-hmm. And so there are resources that are out there that weren't out, out there before. And I would certainly take, take advantage of those if I were in a stage where I was, I was coming out or re- ready to come out and didn't know how, how to do it. Right. Right. Yeah, we're in, we're in a kind of interesting time where there there are more resources legitimately and Absolutely. you know there is in one sense more openness but at the same time there is more uh, I don't know what to call it, polarization, or oh, yes. I don't know the right word for it, but there's a little bit of both going on. It seems like there's no question. In fact, there's been some surveys that have been coming out now since a change in the administration that have shown that there's an increased risk of discrimination, victimization, and even kids, even more thoughts of self-harm mm. uh, because of all the stuff that's, that's, that's been going out. When you've got the leader of, of our nation that's out there that's actively bullying people every day, that kind of gives permission to those who, 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 who haven't bullied in, in the past because it wasn't a, an acceptable thing. It gives them permission to start doing it again. Sure. And it really affects a lot of people who are struggling. It's not just with their sexual orientation or their gender identity, but with, well, with, with anything where they feel, feel vulnerable. Bullies are very good at p- picking up on stuff like that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one thing that came to mind was um, not necessarily just the person coming out themselves, but – Sometimes what happens is they are outed uh, by yes. another person in their lives. Yes. That can carry some risk too, right? There's no question. In fact, you know, some of the stats have shown that the highest risk of suicide is when a person is pre- is prematurely outed. What does it usually look like? Like, is there is there kind of a typical portrait of of you know when someone might be outed? What circumstances? You know, so I think I, I think there's 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 various venues in which that that occurs. Mm-hmm. But a, a couple that really come to mind to me is say that kids are being bullied or teased at school, and maybe uh, say uh, someone found out that they're gay or, or maybe thought they were gay and started the rumor about it or right. started talking about it or put it out on social media. Um, the other, the other thing too, is that say that someone's very angry with, with, with someone else and, and outs them pre- prematurely. Uh, I mean, that, I mean, yeah. And, and we've actually seen that before. I don't know if you remember back in two, 2010, we were having kids that were actually jumping off bridges after yeah. they were being started. Right. I mean, so it's a very traumatic thing. I mean, it's never, a person should never prematurely out someone else. Even if you feel like they're ready to come out, mm-hmm. you have to let that person choose when it's the right time for them, for them to come out. And so let me just say like, here's a, here's an example of how maybe you could help someone come out without pre- prematurely Please, out. Yeah. Yeah. So say that, say that it's a friend of yours and you can say, you know, John, you and I have been friends all the, all the way through high school. We're going to college together. And I, I feel like you're, you're a brother of, of mine. You know, I love you like, like, like a brother and that will, will, will never change. If there's ever any, anything that you'd like to tell me, please feel free to do so. I'll always be your, your, your brother. Mm. Right. And the same with like, like a parent, you know, a, a parent could say, you know, Johnny, I've, I've, I've been your father your whole life and I love you very much. And I always will. 
If there's ever in anything that you want, want to tell me, please feel free to do so. My, my love for you will never change. And then you just drop it. You just let it go. You don't bring up sexual orientation. You don't bring up gender identity. You don't bring up any, any, anything. You just open the door so that they feel comfortable to come out to you when they're ready. And trust me, when they are ready to come out, you will be one of the first persons that they come to because you made that sentence to them or, the, or that, that statement. Yeah, you've, you've been clear enough that you know, even if they don't take you up on it ever, it's in the back of their mind. And if they exactly. are going to, you will be one of the people they think of. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And it makes them feel more more safe, too, because then they'll start to in, internalize that and think, oh, wow, this is actually a friend of mine. And then yeah. uh, your, your relationship with them will actually become closer. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I personally, um, you know, was was honored to be part of somebody, a friend of mine's, you know, first coming out. We were um, we were at a place that was like uh, – it's like a place where you go and you drink wine and there's like a, you can have a picnic and all of that. And we were just, you know, there was five of us or something. And we were just talking about, I think we were just talking about like, what is your type? You know, <laughs> you know, sure. romantically, sexually, you're like, oh, well, what is your type? You know? And, um, I forget who said it, but one of us said, you know, whatever. I mean, like guys or girls, you know, that's whatever. We don't know anything about what your type is. And he was like, honestly, uh, yeah, I'm into guys. And I said, okay, well, what's your type? <laughs> you know? And, oh. <laughs> and from there it was like, it, it, cool. it's just so much more comfortable. <laughs> Totally, totally, and and the way the way that you handle it was just very matter matter of fact. That's the best way to do it. <laughs> yeah. So it, it really it really does make a difference, and, and you know whether it's about these issues around sexual orientation or mental health in general, I, I think that the clarity of of what you say is so important because you can't always you you have. As somebody who's not the one suffering, you have no control over that person's reaction or whether they take you up on it or anything like that. But you can at least make it so clear what you are there for. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. I totally agree with you. Let's, let's um, segue a little bit. You had said a little bit about, um, you know, when we were talking about different topics we could talk about, uh, about like health disparities. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about that. You know, my background is, is, you know, quite privileged. I'm a, you know, mainly heterosexual, cisgendered white dude from California. You know, I I have some background in, in these things, but um, you know a whole lot more about it than I do. So, would sure. you mind just educating me a little bit about that? Sure. So, you know, in, in general, um, health care providers are not, and even to this day, very rarely are they um, taught about lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender health care. And so it, it used to be, you know, in fact, it still is for some in, in the rural areas that um, they would go to their physician and, and be afraid to come out to them. Mm. Or, if, or if they did come out to them, the, the, the doctor may say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to re- refuse to treat you because I don't believe in, in your lifestyle. And wow. so a lot of people, in fact, there's, there's still some, but there's mm-hmm. a lot of older people haven't seen a doctor, say, for decades because of a bad experience that they had a, a long time prior. And so you can imagine not going to see a health healthcare provider because you're not feeling like you're going to be uh, accepted for who, who you are. That can lead to all sorts of physical ailments because that's not being monitored or not having normal screenings. And so for a, a lot of people uh, that are L- LGBT, they've avoided the, the medical uh, care system for quite some time. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, also, um, for people uh, in, in, in general, as we have t- talked about, I mean, GLBT people are at, at higher risk. And it's not because this is innate, because it's the way the society treats them, but they're at higher risk for the mental health issues that aren't screened. They're at higher risk for you know suicide, which isn't screened if, if, if they're not being seen. Mm-hmm. And they're also at, at higher risk for drug and, and alcohol problems, which you can imagine can lead to a plethora of medical issues. Definitely. And, Right. And a lot, a lot of that stuff is not screened because the doctor doesn't know and, and because they don't know and they don't know because the patient does, that doesn't come in anymore because maybe a bad experience that they had in, in the past. And you know what? Even those who do come in now, I mean, they're in fact, let's let's, let's talk about trans care. Sure. Uh, there, there are some stats that, that have come out that have shown up to 40, 50 percent of doctors don't even know how to treat a trans patient in the office. What would be different? Um, you know, so so say there's a doctor that's completely clueless that, uh, yeah. about that there should be a difference. What, what would be the difference? Sure. So, you know, they uh, say say someone comes in and they're 12, 12 years old and say, you, you, you know, doc, I've known ever since I was four or five that I'm trans and I'm starting to go, go through puberty. And this is really causing me great distress. I like to get on hormone blockers. Mm. You know, so that we we could prevent uh, puberty from from occurring. So I won't have to worry about about this later in life. 
or you know people uh, late you know say a, a, adulthood you know they, they come in and say you know I, I feel like I'm I'm, I'm trans and I, I feel like I have the gen- genitalia that I have is not congruent with with my gender and I'd, I'd like to go in and have some you know sex re- reassignment surgery mm-hmm. you know or I wow I want to start hormones and they have no idea how how to, how to deal with that or, or treat it and you know it's and it's not just that that part as well, but a lot of those times those, those people who come in there as as we talked about they're already under great distress i mean uh trans people in general uh from a lot of surveys have shown that uh they're higher risk to be in poverty uh high, higher risk to be uh under ed, ed, educated or have, having to drop drop out of school uh higher risk of not having an you know, jobs, so they're un- unemployed, and mm-hmm. and also not not having a- access to health care, and so a lot of them haven't had access to health care for a long time. And those sound like they're most of those are those are all like secondary issues. It's not because they're trans that they're having these problems, but it's because right. what them being trans creates in their life or their circumstances that leads to That's these right. things, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, you know, one one thing that I, I think comes up a lot is. Um, so you brought up a you know maybe a prepubescent uh, kid who knows that they're trans and is interested in preventing puberty from happening. Uh, yes, that's that sounds scary to a lot of parents or people who uh, aren't trans themselves. About wow, this is such a permanent thing. Why would you you know how could you even know right now? Stuff like that. Those are I imagine those are a lot of the arguments that come up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I could also argue the other way saying, if you know that a kid is trans and they've been talking about it for over a decade and they come in and want to be on hormone blockers and you deny them the ability to do that, imagine the great distress and dysphoria that you're going to cause them because they end up developing breasts or developing genitalia that they didn't necessarily want want to have in in the, in the first place Mm -hmm. that, that causes them much more distress than actually fulfilling their, their needs of wanting to be on hormone blockers to actually prevent them from, from having that. And it's not, and and it's not always necessarily a permanent thing. I mean, if, if a person's put on hormone blockers, it doesn't mean that that's permanent. I mean, if you stop the hormone blockers, then they will develop secondary sex characteristics. So it's not mm-hmm. like you're, you're purposely or, or you're, I'm sorry, it's not like you're, you're permanently, permanently yeah. aging, but you're giving them some time to work through it. And that's the important thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I imagine there's a lot of like false positives too, because as you said, when someone is struggling with their identity, uh, they may develop depression, they may develop mental health issues, or they may uh, self-medicate with drugs, right. alcohol, whatever. Uh, right. I imagine in the healthcare system, there's a lot of treating that rather than acknowledging what's underneath. Well, you know what? And I think that's true. And I think a lot of it is because a, a lot of these patients who come in are actually afraid to come out to their physician. That's for true. Fear. That's true. Yeah. So, you know, kind of like you, you're talking about the friend who can be there as, you know, a potential ally without yes. outing the person, what might you suggest for people who are in like a, a, a care position, whether that's a doctor or otherwise, to, to right. be available as that type of person? That's an awesome question. And uh, so, you know, actually, I uh, in some of my pre- presentations, when I go and talk to medical audiences about this, I mean, so sometimes just in your office, like in, in your waiting room, having like a maybe a small rain, rainbow flag up, mm-hmm. up on the wall or maybe having like a, a pink triangle there. Or, you know, having like the, the trans flag of, available or having literature or magazines that are LGBT themed related. Those are really important signs uh, for the for the patient when they come in to, to the office to know whether it's going to be op- whether they are going to feel comfortable being open and honest about who, who they are. The other thing, too, is say like an in- intake form. I don't know if you remember. I mean, a lot, a lot of docs offices, you go in and have these long in- in- intake forms. If sure. you were to have on there like gender, instead of just having male or female, maybe have trans or maybe have fill in the blank mm. or, you know, uh, talking about sex, you know, or se- sex history, bringing up se- sexual orientation. Yeah. I mean, I notice that so it's, much that right? it's not. Pres- you know, right? there's no representation on forums right. and things exactly. like that. Exactly. And but imagine, though, if a trans person comes in and sees that. I mean, what a difference is like, oh, my goodness, I can actually be open and honest on this in- intake form. Imagine what the doctor is going to be like for me. Right. 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 It's, it makes it much easier for them to be open and honest. And then you can start getting to the underlying reasons for the drug and alcohol misuse or the mental health issues. Definitely. You know, and I think one thing that I've uh, you know, I've, I've had my own thoughts about this, like in my practice, you know, in my practice, I work with a lot of um, elderly people. And yeah. certainly I've had elderly, you know, LGBT 
uh, mm-hmm. individuals, but I have a lot of people who don't know what the hell gender identity is and think it's all kooky and weird and stuff like that. Right. You know, and I've had my, my own thoughts about like, um, you know, is, is it possible to alienate a part of my clientele by being inclusive to others? But I've kind of come to the realization that I don't really give a shit, <laughs> you know, like, right. um, I don't have to be, I don't have to serve everybody if it means that I'm able to serve a, uh, group of people that are under underserved, you know? Right. Right. So yeah. I think that people do need to be a little bit more clear and, and bold and just willing to, to be an ally and present if they are. That's right. Exactly. And, you know, really, I mean, as, as cl- clinicians, we do have an obligation to treat whoever comes in our door. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we, we can't discriminate based on them not identifying with the sex or the, the gender that they were assigned to at birth or because they happen to have a sexual orientation that's out, outside the majority. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, man, we've we've covered a, a wide variety of things here. Um, are there any are there any topics that that you have in mind that you'd like to talk about that we haven't really covered yet? We talked a bit about safety, about the process of coming out, health disparities, Um is there anything else that, that you're really interested in speaking about that we haven't really covered? Well, you know, I actually, yeah, I actually, so when I, uh, when I took early retirement back in March, that's when I, I had just published an, an ebook, uh, called pride. You can't heal if you're hiding from yourself. And so what I had done with that is that I actually made it out into a print book and put it up on Am, uh, Amazon as well. And I, I just wanted your uh, listeners to know uh, that that book is is available and actually it's available as a free download as well. Oh, cool! Yeah, and so if, if people wanted to go to my website, you know, again, drronholt dot com, where you can see, see see the videos, you can also do a free PDF download of my book. And actually, there's a companion coloring book that goes along with it. Um, you know, I actually wrote wrote the book. Um, so the the book's called Pride. You can't heal if you're hiding from from yourself. And the subtitle actually describes what the book as, as is is about. You know, I'm a I'm a proud gay man now and a psychiatrist. But coming out for me was so emotionally excruciating. I almost literally didn't survive it. And I don't want other kids now to go through that. And so I actually wrote the book that I wish that I had had when I was young and when I when I was growing up. And so it's got resources in there. It's got my own coming out story. And also has my knowledge as a psychiatrist, and I put it all all together in a book to help those kids who are struggling with their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And so I just wanted people to know that that's available, especially as a free resource, because I don't want people out there struggling, uh, feeling like there's not resources out there because there are. That's amazing. I, I think it's really, really, really awesome that you've done that, and you know, especially that you. Uh, you know, you're speaking from such a place of authority, not only as a medical professional, but having this lived experience. And, you know, I just yeah. really appreciate that you've been willing to put yourself out there because for some reason, a lot of people in helping professions are afraid to do so. That's right. They are. They are. That's right. And, you know, and the thing is, it's like I always I feel like in life, a lot of us have ad- adversities and what we do with that can actually make, make make a difference in the world. And so for some people, they kind of run, run, you know, run away from it and never deal with it. But for something like what what I went through, I, I I want to take the adversity of what it was like for me coming out. And I want to turn that into assets to which to uh, grow from for others now. Well, you know, what I would like to ask is, say there's somebody out there who's listening to this who is in that questioning stage. Uh, maybe they're just very uncertain and don't quite what to do with, know what to do with themselves, but they know something's different about them. Is there anything that you'd like to say directly to them before we wrap up? Sure. So, you know, I want I, I want those people out there who are struggling with their sexual orientation or their gender identity or even questioning to realize that they're not alone, that this is a normal part of sex, um, sexuality, that you're loved as, as, as you are. There's no reason to be ashamed of it. There's no reason to hide from, from, from yourself about that. Um, it's important for you to reach out, though. Don't feel like you are alone. There are a lot of people that are out there that are there to, to support you. And so whether that's a school counselor or a teacher, or maybe your healthcare professional, or maybe even the, the hotline that we had t- talked about, the, mm-hmm. the Trevor Project. I don't want you to feel like you're, you're alone and you're not. So please reach out for help. It's there for you. 
Great. That's amazing. And where can people find you um, aside from your website? Are you on Twitter as well? And stuff I like am. That? Yeah, yeah, that, yes, yes. So my, my, my Twitter handle is Dr. Ron Holt. So at, at uh, Dr. Ron Holt, I've got about 30,000 followers on there and I tweet out stuff daily. And so, and it's, it's, it's all affirmative stuff and resources and just, you know, just feel, feel, feel good information. So please reach out to me as there. And also my other social, social media I, I, um, icons and info you can find out on, on my website at drronholt.com. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And, uh, uh, cool. you know, definitely people should follow you on social. You tweet out great stuff. And, you know, just yeah. thank you for being out there. Yeah. Thank. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. 